welcome to another episode of Cloud Security Podcast. This is the hotel room edition. We are in Boston still and still taking Cloud Security Podcast on the road. So this is the final episode for our AWS Security Month and in theme for upcoming Black Hat and DEF CON events, which we'll go into a bit more as we kind of go into this conversation. But for this, I have a lovely person who's going to talk to us about fundamentals of AWS Cloud Security Assessment. And uh, just to cue her in, I've got a song ready. Hopefully you guys can hear it. Hopefully that comes across. Whoa! Hey, Cassandra, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Good. So glad to have you here. Uh, and uh, hopefully the song came through as well. Just a little bit. It, it, the full blast wasn't there, but it's metal, so oh, that's I'm, uh, might well, be better. I'm glad. I'm glad. I, I, I was like, uh, I, I hope I'm doing a decent job. But for, for, for a few folks who may be on the internet who may not know who you are, could you just do a quick intro about who Cassandra is? Oh, man, that's a, that's a tough sell. Um, Cassandra is, well, it's me, um, crazy blue haired, uh, engineer that gets dropped into, to zoom calls to scare off clients or just tell them what they should be doing. Um, <laughs> so I am, uh, I'm in security consulting, um, as kind of a cloud security architect engineer ish kind of nebulous title. Um, but my background's actually in it, um, and just, uh, systems administration, things like that. Just got a master's in computer science, which I'm very glad to be done with. Um, and my spare time, I help organize Blue Team Village, which is one of the villages that you're going to be visiting at DEF CON. I also love travel, um, good beer, good drinks, scuba diving, photography, heavy metal. Sounds like a great mix of an individual you would like to know more of. <laughs> um, actually, maybe it's a good part to transition to uh, we are talking about fundamentals of AWS cloud security assessment as well. Maybe how, what, what is a cloud security assessment? I mean, let's just start there first. What is it when people say, oh, I want to do a cloud security assessment? What, what's, what does that mean for you? So I work in consulting. And uh, one of the things that we offer our clients is an assessment of their cloud security architecture, um, what they have deployed sometimes it involves assessing um, plans before something goes into production, mm -hmm. but it can either be something like a series of conversations around um, what their approach is to different areas of their cloud security posture, whether it's, you know, what are the, what is their incident response protocols? Um, you know, how do they have, like, how are users federated into the environment if they are? Um, and kind of looking at all of these different pieces to give recommendations about what they could be doing better um, or in some cases, that's it's more on the configuration side where we actually use open source and um, internally developed tools to actually probe the environment and see if they're, uh, you know, if this if they have security holes in their actual uh, implementation. All right. So wait, sounds almost like pen testing. Is it the same as pen testing? <laughs> I wouldn't say so because most of what we do is informational, um, and a lot of it's also more on the high level side. So. Right. Oftentimes we'll sit down and have a conversation with a network, you know, the network's team to get an idea of how they're doing things in the environment, or, you know, we'll go and kind of just get a list of like what uh, network infrastructure they have deployed, um, you know, pull firewall rules and kind of see if there are any gaps. It's probably more something like a like gap analysis in, in some way. Yeah. We're not actually usually executing to the point of actually trying to get like, you know, the, the domain admin um, equivalent in the cloud side. All right. It's a so, little different. So it's not like you're trying to do like a, I don't know, like a cross-site scripting or a SQL injection to basically to your point about the gap analysis part where it's more like architecturally, is this built correctly? Uh, is it an obvious misconfiguration? Is that, did I get that right? Yeah, I, I think what you're, one thing you hit on was uh, SQL injection. So there's kind of different pieces that we look at. The application side is only one part of those. So mm -hmm. part of it would be, I'm gonna look at your, um, you know, your your pipeline, your, your CI, CD pipeline and see kind of how you have it set up. Like if you've got, you know, Jenkins running on an EC2 instance, you know, in a VPC and it's kind of open, then that kind of provides an opportunity for someone to actually inject um, malicious code or into, into the pipeline as it's deployed. You know, how are your Git repos set up? You know, do you have least privilege implemented correctly? Things like that. Um, and on the other side, especially for SQL injection, which is actually one of my, my favorite things, because li little side story, which I'm sure I'll 
yeah. to a lot of. But um, when I was in my master's program, I took a database class. And literally the example that the uh, professor and TA showed of like how to use like how how you would set up how you would write javascript to like do a sql query had injection like it wasn't like parameterized any or, or sanitized input and i was just like no <laughs> but no way as in they were teaching that example in the class yeah <laughs> oh my god and it was really sad <laughs> everyone kind of went ahead and just assumed this is how it is done i guess yeah i actually made like a forum post and i was like don't do this this is bad but i hopefully they listen to me uh, but but as you know, to, to really bring it back to the actual topic at hand, uh, you know, one of the things that we would talk about in our assessment is, you know, um, when we when we talk about secure pipeline, we're going to ask, like, what tools do you have that are scanning code for potential issues like, um, you know, SQL injection um, or um, dependency issues, things like that. So it's kind of the, the assessment part is the process of asking those questions and identifying things that they may want to tighten up a little bit. Yeah. And in something like a config assessment, we'd probably like, you know, look at like, how, how is this tool set up? And is it actually, is it actually checking the thing that it's intended to check? Right. And to your point, then the way I see it, how would you describe it to, for people who, you know, people from pen testing backgrounds, obviously it's going to just understand that now because it's not really pen testing, but more of a vulnerability assessment. Like for what's the value to people when they get a vulnerability assessment done? What what's the value that I guess is being provided from? Is it just to find out what the current state is, or is it more like before pre-deployment? Because a lot of people maybe listening to this for the first time, and because this is fundamentals, just so that we, we we don't leave them leave the newbies in the dark. What's the value of a cloud security assessment provides to a customer? I mean, I think it can be done at any stage. We've had. Uh... We've had clients that are that actually have us come in while they're still planning, and then they can adjust the planning to compensate for issues. Like we'll have lengthy discussions about what tools they want to use at what points, um, you know how they how they should be setting up their network um, in the cloud. You know what's their plan for SSO? How is SSO being controlled from the very start all the way to the end? Um, and then, you know, we will come in and also do assessments for clients who already have infrastructure running. And it's really, I mean, it's it's informational, but it's also you don't know what's vulnerable until it gets popped. If you if you aren't like kind of if you aren't in a position where you have a full time team dedicated to security that yeah. has the specific skill set for looking at cloud security, then you might need to have an extra external pair of eyes or you know, several pairs of eyes look at all the different pieces. That's a good point. And maybe it's a good segue into my next question then. What are some of the building blocks for running a cloud security assessment? I think the first the first building block is actually buy-in. <laughs> you kind of have to have this, this agreement that we're actually going to do that. And to, to be able to have those conversations around, you know, discussing different areas, different perspectives on the same infrastructure. Um, and I mean, the main building blocks are honestly just having a robust sense of like, what are the components? What are all the areas that we're looking at? Because, you know, like if we were going to just going to do, you know, an application analysis, that would be completely different. That's yeah. not even something I do. I, you know, I, I, I kind of like, I like AppSec and I want to learn about, more about it, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, definitely not an expert. So I wouldn't like sell myself for that. But, um, you know, I, I think we want to make sure that we have this like, Okay, here, here's we're going to look at the secure pipeline section, and then we're also going to look at the IAM section. We're going to look at overall architecture, and I know we we've talked about this, um, you and I, about the different talks I'm doing. But yeah. you know, I've done a lot recently talking about AWS organizations, um, and organizations is you know essentially let's take all these different AWS accounts and you know put them in a in a logical hierarchy, and then impose rules based on the purpose of those accounts, um, and you know, so we always, we try to have those conversations with customers and some of them aren't at the point where they're even using organizations where they have everything in one account. And that's not really, I hate to use a buzzword, but it's not scalable. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we kind of have all these different areas that we, that we look at and, uh, and then we can map tools, um, benchmarks and processes to match that. Like, you know, there's Azure benchmarks. I'm sure CSA has some um, CIS benchmarks just you know, compliance frameworks, things like that. Yep. 
Yep. And I, th- I think uh, I was my calling. I'm going to take a moment there because we've got about 20, 30 people online. If you, if you folks have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments as well. Um, and we'll be happy to answer them as well. Now, to your point then, there are benchmarks that exist. Uh, what are some of the low-hanging fruits that you see as quite common across the assessment that you run? I've actually seen quite a range. <laughs> actually, there was one I did a few months ago that was like, I found it really hard and I was still like, it was one of the first ones I did. And I was like, oh my God, are they all going to be this hard? And it's because the client was so good. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. good. Uh, and then, you know, I had, I, I've had another one recently that like, there were, a, there was a lot of low hanging fruit. So um, I don't think there's any average. It just depends on the maturity of the client. Right. But like MFA securing root accounts, not using root accounts um, and proper IM are all kind of things that should be foundational, but can, really? can definitely be misinterpreted or, or not set up correctly. Interesting. Uh, uh, we would ask Stenio. Hey, Stenio, uh, locking in as well. Uh, so that's interesting. A root account with um, without, without MFA and people use you're still using root account. Interesting. Yeah. So and people thought IAM is hard. Uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, so to your point, then I guess it's also like, are there any tools and stuff that you use to do all these assessments for yourself, or how does that work? So we have internally developed tools that would do um, configuration assessment. So it's really using uh, uh, Bodo 3, Python library, mm-hmm. um, SDK to kind of um, pull resources and just do some validation against against different settings. Um, the main one we use that we try to run is Prowler, which is just probably the most robust out of all the tools. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, like, you do a scan, you've got like more results than you know what to do with. So I'd say it's, it's definitely challenging because you can have all the best tools in the world, but if you don't know how to interpret the results, you're kind of going to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. And a uh, shout out to Tony, Tony De La Fuente as well, who I met at the Reinforcer. He's the creator of Prowler. Great person. Great. I think they're expanding more capabilities within Prowler as well. So definitely people should check that out. I but, have opinions uh, on that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm curious. So, because I know they have Prowler Pro, but what's your opinion on the Prowler? Um, well, I love it, but there are some things that are not worded very well. Oh, and also, I I feel like at some point, I'm trying to, I don't know. So we have like a, our internal tool has an integration where it actually runs Prowler. Mm. um, But I don't know if Prowler natively handles multiple accounts. Uh, Oh, so. I had, I had to look. I had to check this. Cause I don't want to. I don't, don't want to just like insult the tool without you know knowing it. And that's not an insult at all. It's just again, like, know, you know, we're we're right. always looking at, at uh, yeah, we're, we're always looking at environments where there are multiple accounts. So like yeah. being able to have tools that provide some amount of automation for um for actually like separating out different accounts and running all the scans against that in the yeah. you know you have an environment with twenty five different AWS accounts. You don't want to have to run something that many times. Like, I think I, there was another, there's another tool I forgot to mention too. That's Paku. Um, yeah, Paku's good. Paku, yeah. I went up like writing a bash script to like import the account numbers and credentials to like run it repeatedly. Cause you can only do like one account at a time. Oh my God. I mean, and people <laughs> have like hundreds of accounts as well sometimes these days, right? Probably. I, I've only seen upwards of like 20 something, but I'm still, That's still, quite I'm still a bit. transitioning over from like more of the cloud engineering side into, into this. So. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So 20 accounts as well, still quite a bit then. I mean, and, and talking about automation as well, because to your point, then if majority of the conversations you're having around cloud security assessments are around multiple accounts in AWS, uh, scaling that across. So if you were just to talk about one account, people can use tools like Prowler, Paco, it seems like I do a good job and add their own flavor on top of it for however they want to contextualize whatever is being identified, I guess. When it comes to scaling to multiple accounts, how does that work? So would that, again, a wrapper on top of this? Or people have, are, are, there, be, are there better ways that you've identified that people can use to do scale it across multiple accounts? Um, I mean, that's kind of a, that, that's a dangerous question because mm-hmm. I have a, you know, programming background. Um, you know, computer science masters, I got to do some programming. Yeah. And... Like I look at all these tools, I'm like, oh, I should, I could do it this way, and I, you know, I have an opinion about that because I could literally jump in and and do it, and you know, in Python or probably not Bash. My Bash is not that great, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, there are absolutely ways to scale it, and I think one thing that I'm that I'm interested in exploring, and I have started actually exploring, is um, doing assessments and enumeration based on organizations. So actually, like 
you know, if you kind of get read only access and you could see what an organization looks like, you've got, okay, wow, my, my hands are like, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm mirrored, so my hands are backwards. You know, you've got your like top management account. That is basically the root of all the roots. Yep. Root to rule them all or, or whatever. Yep. So you've got that account and then you've got, you know, maybe like a couple child accounts or OUs with, you know, more accounts underneath them. So it's just this kind of, I mean. Like a, like a tree structure, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Reverse the binary tree, all that fun stuff. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So, I see, and, um, I, but when you more. when you have that kind of structure, you know, the idea of having a tool that can go in and enumerate that, and also enumerate like what service control policies are in place to actually like lock down the maximum permissions of each account within mm -hmm. a certain OU. Like, that's a really interesting space that I'm I'm digging into now, and it's 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 really fun. Interesting, and I think I've got a question here from Roderick as well. Do you use any AWS tools? Um, we mostly, when we do assessments, sometimes we play around with some of the AWS stuff, but it's really about looking from the outside to see what the client is actually using. So, you know, it, actually one of the things that we assess is what native AWS tools, like security tools, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, guard duty, um, inspector, things like that, like what, what tools is the client actually using? And that can be something in our findings. Like if, if they think that they're gonna put most of the, you know, most of the security tools like close to the source and, and in AWS, then we wanna know kind of, is that running? Is it running in all the different accounts in the organization? Is it maybe running in some, but not others? Um, things like that. So it's really, when we do assessments, it's usually more about enumeration and then translating that data not necessarily using the AWS environment itself to do that work. Right. So maybe I think I answer it does answer the question, but I think maybe I'll come back to the mitigation because it kind of goes into the mitigation as well. So is there a uh, and thanks for that question, Roderick? Do is there like a methodology that you follow for say I come to you, Cassandra, I need to do like an assessment right now? Uh, what, what's kind of the first few things that goes to your mind? or the methodology that you have to approach a cloud security assessment? Because a lot of people would be interested to know the thinking process behind it and how do they kind of approach it. So how do you approach a, any ass assessment? I kind of have a template. Um, there are patterns and sort of existing templates that, that we use. You know, I'm, I'm not the first person in my organization to do this. So I've relied on kind of learning what other people's processes are and pulling templates and stuff. So that kind of gives us that, that list of the different areas that we look at so we you know looking at IEM and and all of that but um I think one important process part of the process as well is to think about what is the purpose of this of this organization what are they doing in the cloud what are their objectives mm -hmm. um because one thing I find myself asking a lot and this probably applies to everything else in life too is what is the problem you're trying to solve so as an example um I was digging into one where um the client was talking about they were, I think they were, um, I would say they were using like so, like a static set of parameters that they had stored like in in a file in, in like S3, which sounds kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> and the, the first instinct is to be like, why would you do that? If you have <laughs> an application running, why would you reach out to S3 and pull this information? It might've been something not, it might've not been S3, but it was something similar. Like it wasn't like a native tool for that. Right. And we would want to say like, you need to move everything like that to Secrets Manager. Yeah. But I, but we have this conversation I stopped and was like, wait a minute, what, what are you actually pulling from this? And the thing is, it turned out that 90% of what was in there, it was not actually important. It was stuff that was, that could have been public information anyways. It was just like, a, you know, a normal config file that didn't have any sensitive information. So the, the actual answer was, yeah, only, you only need to move 10% of this into, into um, secrets manager. You don't actually need to go through, you know, whatever their development process was to literally change every single call uh, into a call to secrets manager. So it's really about knowing what the purpose is and also knowing how valuable the data is. You're gonna treat a, you know, a healthcare client much differently than you're gonna treat someone running a static web page. Right, and actually that's a good point because that would also encourage the conversation for what would someone use a particular service for? Say S3 bucket for storage. Yeah, it makes sense. But if they're hosting a website, that may be even more juicy content over there, I guess. Depends on what it is. Yeah. I mean, it could be like my favorite cat photos.com. 
<laughs> yeah, it could be like, that as well. I think oh, that makes me think of a question as well. In the conversations that you have, what are some of the common services that you have, um, I guess you come across from an AWS perspective? What are people using most of these days? EC2, S3, RDS, like what do you come across more often? I have definitely seen a lot of those, um, a lot of the notification services as well, SNS, SQS, SES somewhat. Um, I'm trying to think what else, what have I like just looked at? I've actually seen stuff. more like Kafka recently, like those kind of services. Right, like an open source solution hosted on an EC2 or? So it's an AWS service that's like managed streaming for Apache Kafka. So it's kind right. of like integrated. Right. There's also like, I think one confusing point is, you know, RDS is actually the basis of so many different services that you give clients that are like, oh, I'm using Aurora or, you know. Um, Post-SQL, know. Post Postgres. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then you're like, oh my God, what, you know, I, don't even, I haven't even heard of that. And then you mm. find out it's just basically RDS with some extra toppings or something. Yeah. So a lot, lots of different things there. Yeah. Actually, that makes me think of another question then. Like, because there would be people who would be using managed services versus unmanaged services as well. So how does an assessment kind of uh, separate that out, I guess? Is there a way to misconfigure an RDS? What would be an example of a misconfigured RDS, I guess? I think the most obvious thing to me that I always flag is if you're running RDS, it's not just about the control plane. It's mm -hmm. about the data plane. So you can have something look completely fine from a management perspective, like, you know, you've restricted access to who can actually, you know, control the top level, you know, things about the database. But when you get down to the, the actual data plane, you know, people don't even realize that you can use like AWS SSO, which you, you know, maybe have connected with your Azure AD credentials to actually access the data plane, like the actual data. So Maybe you have an exposed database that's pretty well controlled on the control plane side, but you still yeah. have like, you know, default like SQL admin credentials or something like that that are probably easy to crack and publicly accessible. Actually, that's, that brings me to another question because we're talking about fundamentals. A lot of people would not even know what a control plane or data plane is. <laughs> that's a really good point. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> yeah. So how, how, what is the control plane according to you and what is the data plane in the AWS cloud landscape? <laughs> I feel like that... That was like half a talk right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, it's like something you kind of like instinctively know, and I, I don't know how well I'm going to put into words. I know what you mean. Essentially... But, but half the people don't even know that. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. you're just saying words like, oh, control plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what I think control the, plane is. I think the, 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 the probably the simplest example I would use is not actually RDS, but S3. Hmm. So control plane would be like, who gets to create and delete buckets? Um, who gets to set, you know, what can access these files. Mm -hmm. um, and then data plane is like, what are the files who has access to, or like who can share them and can, you know, can people download them or something like that? So that's kind of the best. I think that's a good way to put it. And I guess <laughs> would, would that also, cause you know how people throw the shared responsibility thing in there as well. And it's kind of just easy to just slap on shared responsibility to every conversation for, for cloud. One of the reasons why my question for the managed part and non-managed part was that as well. To your point, some of the control plane may not be under your con your control. You may just have the data plane access, which is kind of like the example of RDS. You can't you can tell Amazon I want Postgres or I want Aurora, but I can't really tell them I want this specialized version of this really old ass uh, Aurora for whatever reason. I just had it would always be the latest one. So how does the assessment change for that kind of a thing? I think at some point we kind of have to set some scope. Yeah. Um, you know, there's only certain, there's only so much that we can see. Like I can see that you've got, you know, um, a last cache for Redis or, you know, Postgres or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but I can't see what's, you know, what's in the database and how like Postgres is configured specifically. Unless you just literally copy the database entire into which is kind of like what a big data breach right there as well. Like, so you, do you want me to commit a data breach and then tell you how bad this is? Or <laughs> uh, that's yeah. a good point. I think so. To your point, scope is maybe that's probably one of the fundamental things as well. Then, where before you even kind of like what we did. With, I mean, I'm not. I'm going to compare it to pen testing again, but just the scope conversation is very similar in that regard for how wide do you want to go? Because to your point, if you're looking at 20, 30 AWS accounts and each one of them has like a mix of managed services and unmanaged services, that's a lot of work. 
And like, how long do these co- like is engagements go on for? Um, you know, it depends on how deep we want to go. So we've had right. some where it's you know um, could be a couple weeks. Some of them just like one week, a couple days of work, maybe. You know, where we just take kind of the low hanging fruit and the highest, most critical. So one week for twenty eight AWS accounts. Yeah. Holy shit! Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like automation is wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even with automation, because you have to put some context on top of it as well, right? It's not just like, hey, here's the result. Because you, I imagine, similar to Appentis, you have to write a report, put some context. Like the example that you mentioned earlier, where the static files that were in S3 bucket, as you kind of dig into it, that's a, I mean, that's, I imagine that's like a half a day conversation right there. By the time you found it, found the right person to talk to about it as well. So is the same kind of challenges exist in the assessment world as well, where it's like, I'm going to, the mirror thing is gone again. <laughs> Uh, uh, is that the same conversation there as well, where it's almost similar to pen testing? That I mean, I can understand why people misunderstand it because pen testing is similar. You get very limited time. Do what, do your worst is what they tell you. But you're like, well, you haven't given me the time to do my worst. But sure, I'll try and do it in this limited budget and limited scope that I have, whatever I can, in the limited time that you've offered me. Yeah, I mean. We also go in stages too. So sometimes we'll do a set of scans, interpret results, put them in a report. And honestly, I hate doing reports. I don't feel like clients should be spending that much money for me to like yell at Excel and PowerPoint or God forbid Microsoft Word. It's the worst. Oh, oh my God. So I, I mean, <laughs> we try to keep it as min- it, that part as straightforward as possible. Doesn't always work. You know, depends on the client. But, um, you know, oftentimes it can be like, we're going to run a bunch of scans and then we're going to come talk to, you know, the teams involved about what the results are. And then we get some clarification from them. A lot of it is we put the onus on them to actually do the clarifying, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll say, okay, you have this many exposed IP addresses. Like, is this intentional or not? If it is intentional, is this something that's an exception that's already been approved? And if so, then you kind of assume the risk of doing so. Um, So a lot of it is really just kind of this back and forth. And then we may also have things where we're working with a team that actually does some of the remediation and then we rescan, kind of refresh the results of the assessment. Um, You know, we may or may not do something like, um, you know, a a more thorough network review where we look at like firewalls and rules and things like that. So it's, it's variable, but it's not like, it's not like full weeks of work. It's usually just that like, a burst and then a handoff and a discussion and then waiting for follow-up. So it right. just drags on for a long time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I appreciate you being patient with me as I'm trying to like you know, peel off the layers for people who may be do, hearing about these terms for the first time as well. So to your point, then you've run the scan, you've identified things, you've identified external IPs as well. And uh, the whole in scope for what, what's actually in scope versus what's not in scope. I'm assuming they, they would, it would be like a, for lack of a better word, a gray box, like you would get credentials to the AWS accounts, like a, some kind of an IAM user, or is it completely black box where it you don't have access to it apart from just saying, hey, uh, this is our IP? Like, I don't know how, how, what's the kind of usual things you're provided? So we usually wind up with uh, some, um, some type of credentials and uh, a, ro- a read only role within the environment. So again, you know, it's not a pen test where we're actually trying to do anything in the environment. We're just looking at it. Right. So it's basically if if you're for anyone familiar with you know all the different IAM rules for every service, it's basically like list or well not list actually that might be wrong that might be data plane but you know get describe a lot of get and describe. So we're saying let's get your S3 buckets. Let's describe mm. them. Yeah. You know is um, account level block public access enabled or not. And that's like what we would look for, but yep. that can all be done with read only credentials. Right. And that's usually right. what we're given. Interesting. And let, let's talk about maybe switch gears and talk about mitigation as well. Cause I think that's definitely a lot of information for people to digest from a, Hey, I've got my fresh start in cloud security assessment. What I, what I would per- personally get, how I can approach it. And you can probably look at the tools as well. So from a mitigation perspective as well. So, all the blue teamers who are, and you've got your blue hair as well, so it kind of fucks in really well. Where of all the blue blue teamers who would be probably expecting, okay, what's the right thing to approach this? Because this could technically be a fundamental for mitigation as well. We mentioned the root account earlier. Um, you kind of talk a lot about AWS organizations quite publicly as well on how they could be done better. So 
what are some of the foundational pieces that you feel people could be doing right, especially in like a large scale 28 of US account kind of structure? Um, I mean, I think the main thing is is securing those root credentials. Okay. Um, that's just, you know, MFA, you want to be doing everything from a different user account. Ideally, if you're in an organizational environment, you should be using SSO to get into the environment in the first place and making sure that your security on the originating side is is good. Like if you're using Azure AD to get into your AWS environment, then your Azure AD account should have MFA in it, um, as an example. Um, you know, for, for the root account credentials themselves, you know, MFA it, lock it away, don't throw away the key because unfortunately you do need that like for very rare occasions. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, have have like a small set of people as a you know as a backup that have access to it, and make sure that access to the email accounts that all of these are registered under is actually secured as well because I've seen that before too. Right. And I in my past life was you know an O three six five admin, so <laughs> um, you know a a. Uh, Tying your entire organization's root account to a mailbox running on old exchange, an old exchange server with uh, basic authentication is probably not a good idea. <laughs> so don't yeah. do that. <laughs> basic auth is definitely, I think we should have gotten over basic auth ages ago, but uh, here we are still talking about basic auth. Yeah, so that's a whole other conversation. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, other, other essentials, like just understanding and using um, IAM implementing least privilege, definitely very important. You know, thinking about your encryption in transit and encryption at rest for each individual service that you're using. If mm -hmm. you're using organizations, you should be um, doing centralized cloud trail. It's way easier. If yep. you're using control tower, which is, it, control tower is kind of another layer on top of organizations. It's definitely a whole another whole other, whole other conversation. Right. Um, but you know, you want to make sure you have logging enabled in those environments send it to a SIM. Hopefully after that point, you'll figure out what to do with the logs once you get them, because it's a fire hose. Uh, yep. yep. I have yep. an upcoming yep. panel talk where we're going to get into that a little bit. So, oh, oh, so there's a panel talk for this at the AppSec Village as well. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, and uh, is that going to be streamed anywhere? So people can, who are listening to this may not be attending AppSec Village, but can they listen in on the conversation as well? So the one I'm doing is Blue Team Village, and we are not able to stream any of the in-person talks. We uh, do have some virtual content, though, but I did not manage to get any cloud cloud stuff in that one next year. <laughs> next year. Next year. So for people who probably attend, they should definitely attend that session as well then. So to your point, coming back to the mitigation, so make sure root account with MFA. Actually, where do, where do you stand on the whole, when you have 20 AWS accounts and 20 root accounts, do you have, like, because some people believe in the industry should just re just reset the password for root and just delete it or just you know delete the password because or some people just go well i'm not going to do anything with it i'm just going to control access to it so where do you stand on that one usually that's a really good question i personally haven't messed around enough with the, that whole setup to have broken it badly enough to have a strong opinion <laughs> fair enough um uh, but i think so with organizations when you have that like top management account, yep. that one you would always want to keep access to because there are some billing functions uh, that are tied to that or that okay. you can only use within there. Um, other than that, I I would probably save and secure them, but you know put them in you know a shared shared with very few people, um, you know, safe somewhere. <laughs> like I mean, literally, like you know, if you have multiple root accounts that that are extre extremely important than having a hardware MFA token that's in a, locked in a fire safe in an office is not actually the worst plan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see, that reminds me of talking about fire safe as well. Like the whole, uh, the substructure that they have, kind of like a container or like a, I mean, my, my mind is like a safe, but we have organization and when you have organization units underneath it as well. Uh, and you can kind of, so there's a whole SCP conversation to be had over here as well. Uh, so, I'm doing a talk about that. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, like, how would you kind of, and what is it, first of all, for people who do not know fundamentals, what is it, and <laughs> why is it relevant for organizations? So, a service control policy is basically um, a higher level IAM policy uh, that basically sets kind of the maximum permissions allowed, and it is applied to an OU or an AWS account within an organization. Mm -hmm. So, let's uh, let's say we've got you know, another 
another key thing to do is if you've got you know a production environment and a dev environment, you absolutely want to keep those separate. And that's a reason to use multiple AWS accounts because that is absolutely the security boundary as an AWS account. So what you would do in that case is say like, okay, you maybe you know your dev environment is only accessible from you know from your organization, whether it's a certain set of IPs or users or however you want to do it. Um, so you know maybe it doesn't ever need any external facing access. Yep. So in SCP, you could actually use it to to restrict the creation of any you know public IP addresses, for example. Um, a couple key ones, which I'm going to talk about in my um, Diana Initiative talk, are um, restricting uh, where you can create resources. So you know if you know you're only using US East One, what you should do is create a service control policy that basically doesn't allow anyone to create anything outside of that region. Um, you know, if I were if I were a smart attacker, I'd probably be like, let me hide this so no one can see it until it's too late and I've already like run a crypto miner for you know 72 hours or, or whatever <laughs> the case may be. Um, other ones are, um, I think one that's it might be a default for control tower, not sure, is basically saying a user, a new user to the to the account or to a to a role or to their a federated user essentially can't do anything until they've configured MFA for their account. Like they literally can't even, they can't do anything except for configure MFA. Wow. That's pretty, that's yeah. a pretty cool SCP. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's a great guardrail to have. Yeah. Um, and what, what are guardrails? Or what are you on it? Because people <laughs> don't even know that. Like, well, there's two, well, okay. That's a little trick question. Um, so gar there's actually a feature in, um, in control tower that's called guardrails, like the capital G. Oh. And it's essentially like kind of a, a, I think it actually is just is SCPs under the hood, right? But then we use the we use the general term guardrails to basically indicate, um, you know, what are the the absolute boundaries that someone should that someone has to stay within, you know, oh, kind of just to keep everything like reasonably on track. Right. I mean, maybe it's worthwhile actually. I didn't realize they just kind of went down the path of saying guardrails and the control tower as well. What is control tower, and is, can anyone access it? Control Tower is actually a paid service. It basically takes organizations and adds functionality to it. And not going to lie, I know way more about organizations than about Control Tower. Um, but there are some weird things that they do differently that I that trip me up a little bit. Right. Um, on the other hand, organizations is completely free. So I actually ran a training at Besides Charm that involved setting up different accounts and working with OUs and SCPs in AWS organizations. Yep, yep. And you can do the whole thing within free tier. Interesting. You can do the whole, and is this like going to be published later in the year somewhere as well? So people can, uh, that one's, it's actually up already. <laughs> I can oh, drop really? you a link. Oh yeah. yeah. That'd be awesome <laughs> if it's already up. So people can use the free resource for it as well. So trying to figure out, uh, how we use a paid control tower to do it. So it sounds like, and you can pretty much get the same kind of control, using free open source, I mean, not open source, but as, the, as an SCP in organizations, you don't have to really go for control tower. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, uh, control right. tower is, is extra on top of that. Interesting. As an organization, I think that's, you know, if your organization is looking to to use, or, <laughs> if your organization is looking to use AWS organizations, that is always so confusing to say. <laughs> Thanks, AWS, for the really obvious names for things. <laughs> guardrails as well, like, and if they want to use your guardrails, yeah. like <laughs> It's impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, if your company is is moving to the cloud and is considering using, you know, organizations and or or control tower, yes. I would absolutely suggest that they investigate first and decide whether or not to use control tower, because it does centralize logging in a different way, and it does not appear to be very easy to convert just from organizations over to control tower. Oh, so <laughs> it centralizes logging as in centralized it to security hub or guard duty or something? So basically creating tra cloud trail trails to collect logs in every account and yeah. then putting them into a uh, an S3 bucket in a separate log archive account. So AWS actually has recommendations for structuring your company's assets. And it's it's literally like their recommendations are you have an account that's dedicated to security tooling you have an account that's dedicated to collecting logs, like this log archive account. Yep. You know, you have a production, you know, you have non-prod dev, whatever stage sometimes plays in there. 
So they actually have extensive documentation on with recommendations for patterns that you can use to structure your organization's deployment to the cloud, which is really cool. Interesting. I might take that link from you as well, so I can put that on the show notes. Um, maybe uh, one final question then as well. What do you think people should be skilled in if for future cloud security assessors who may be listening to this conversation or on that journey, are like, oh, Cassandra said it so well, I'm super excited. I want to be part of this, what, this uh, bandwagon of cloud security assessors out there. How can someone learn about this? I guess what needs to be done and tooling and all that as well. What has been helpful for you to kind of walk that path that the others can follow as well? I mean, I think the first thing is just a willingness to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and hand in hand with that is not being completely wedded to the things that you already know. So, you know, I, I come from an IT background and some, you know, a lot of that is completely on premise. And there's a lot of things that, e that you would default to, you know, things that you think you know on premise that just don't work in the cloud because that's just not how it's supposed to work. Um, and, you know, kind of like making sure that you're that you're taking it from the start is is definitely a definitely good thing. But generally speaking, um, for actual skill sets, I think just playing around with it, getting some familiarity, a little bit of programming helps. Um, I might get some shit for saying that, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, but under, understanding how APIs work, because under the hood, AWS is all just APIs. And when you when you when you get to like intermediate level in in your cloud experience, you need to understand how to use you know CLI and and know that there's it's just a lot of API calls under the hood, and that's kind of fundamental information to know. Um, yeah. So. Programming helps. That's what it does. Idea. It really does. Especially if you're looking <laughs> at like more than one AWS account, you definitely feel like you definitely need to have that. Yeah, and and basic like you know a basic set of IT skills is always going to be helpful for that. Sounds good. Uh, that was pretty much the time that I had for all the technical questions. But I got three surprise questions for you just to get mm -hmm. to know. You. So that uh, so these are basically just to get to know you a bit more for the audience as well. So first one, just three ones. There are not too many. Where do you spend most time on when you're not working on technology or cloud? Oh, um, so pre-pandemic, I traveled very extensively. I've been to over 50 countries. Wow. I love travel. Like, I am obsessed with travel. I'm literally just oh, working so I can retire early and travel. Oh, just 20, 50 countries. How many countries are there? Isn't there like 56 or something in total? Oh, no, I said fi over 50. You've all, oh, sorry, yeah. I, I yeah. got that wrong. <laughs> oh, <laughs> who, I don't know. I hear you. So, wait, how, but how many countries are there in total around the world? Is it like 50 something? It depends it... on which list you check, and that's kind of gets to be a little political. <laughs> oh, okay. I've been to some that, that me like, depends on how you count. I've been to like between 48 and 51 countries. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. Well, that's a great hobby to have. So, what has that been post? Well, it's not really post pandemic, but like, I think whatever stage we are in, in the post-pandemic, pre-pandemic kind of uh, world, or not post, yeah, what, what, whatever mid-tier world we are in living in. Post-pandemic start. <laughs> yeah, post-pandemic start. Let's just call it that. So what are you spending most time on the, uh, now? I mean, honestly, in, in, in um, early 2020, I bought a house, got COVID right after moving in, and then spent a lot of time online. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been volunteering with Blue Team Village, which is a... Uh, Blue Teamer security, you know, um, hacking village at DEF CON. And I, I've been a volunteer since the beginning and it's turning five this year. Oh, wow. um, and I just kind of dug in and started doing more with the village, um, started a mentoring program that's now in its second year. Um, I started doing a lot of presentations online, like a ton. So <laughs> I'm actually you know, going to DEF CON. I'll be doing two talks and a panel. Wow. And then another talk later in the month, too, at <laughs> Blue Team Con. <laughs> just, just your uh, casual uh, speaking month, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but also <laughs> jigsaw puzzles and, and baking now that I have an actual kitchen. So oh, it's not, well, not just not just online stuff. <laughs> congratulations on the new house as well, by the way. Now Thank you can you. bake all your bake, bake to your heart's content. content. Yep. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, the second question that I have is, what is something that you're proud of but is not on your social media? Oh my God, that's a good one. I, 
I, I don't know. I feel like I talk about everything on social media. <laughs> like, go to my Twitter. It's just I, I'm I'm a pretty open book. Like all all, all your uh, achievements are on Twitter. Yeah, basically. All right, fair I, so okay, funny story about that though. Um, if you look back far enough in my Twitter history, I actually created Twitter initially to keep track of my travel when I was doing a year and a half long round the world trip. So I have oh. some really interesting tweets early on there. <laughs> All right, we should probably, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave your Twitter handle on the uh, show notes as well so people can find that out. Um, I, and I'm, I'm looking forward to reading some of that content as well from one year of world travel. That would have been fun. Oh my God. It, the only reason I came back is because I ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> As all of us do, unfortunately, <laughs> if only. Uh, I hope Jeff Bezos is listening and gave us some money, I guess, with all the AWS conversation we're having. Um, the final question on, on this is, what's your favorite cuisine or restaurant that you can share? Mm. I'm fortunate enough to live in a neighborhood that has amazing Ethiopian food. Oh, like so, peanut bread and like oh, darabad, yeah. darabads. Yeah, all of it. It's great. And I, I was actually... I had planned to go to Ethiopia in summer 2020 and then the pandemic happened. It's really sad. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, if things open up, you get to do that now. But I think I, that was, that was interesting. You know? It makes me feel like I should have Ethiopian for dinner tonight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Apparently Boston has really good Eth Ethiopian food as well. So I'm going to check that out. Nice. But nice. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Where, where can people find you to have any, uh, answer any follow-up questions or anything they want to, want, uh, at least from a cloud security assessment perspective, they wanted to reach out to you for. Where can they find you? Uh, so Twitter is definitely the best bet. I'm at Muteki underscore RTW, which uh, I'm sure will get posted. Mm -hmm. um, LinkedIn too. I I don't check it nearly as much as Twitter, so I definitely would would point you at Twitter. Uh, um, and then I'm again speaking at uh, at summer camp. So I'm speaking about AWS organizations um, and those those guardrails <laughs> that I talked about. <laughs> Not um, the control tower guardrails, the actual guardrails. The actual guardrails. Yep. <laughs> um, so that's at uh, Diana Initiative, uh, one of the two days. I, I forget when it's scheduled for. Um, and then at DEF CON itself, I'll be speaking about securing pipelines uh, at Cloud Village, just sharing some of the things I've learned from doing assessments and all the interesting stuff I've seen. Um, and then Friday night at Blue Team Village, my village, um, I'm actually leading a, um, a panel that where well, we're going to get into not just getting into the cloud and about cloud, but how we actually blue, blue team the cloud um, in taking that, uh, what we have already and making it better. So, you know, what do we do with the logs once we have, have them? What are incident responders looking for in those logs? Um, yeah. So we're, we're hoping that we get a, a good audience for that and it should be pretty interesting. Well, you're talking about the right, right place, so you can definitely get a right audience for that as well. So uh, I'll make sure I tweet about it as well. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation. And I think uh, thank you to everyone else who participated and asked their question as well. Uh, I I'm looking forward to having you again. But thank you so much for your time, Cassandra. And thank you, everyone else who kind of joined us as well. Talk to you soon. Enjoy the feed. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>